sacrifice to build the original church. And God used that community of believers in that alabaster church to, in essence, build three churches. Because they said it's not about the building. The building is simply a tool to reach people for Jesus. And so today when we give in our alabaster fund, we're giving the opportunity to sow seed. Last Sunday in our Bible study, we talked about sowing seed. And that seed is the word of God. And so whenever we plant an alabaster church, we're planting a place where the word of God can be shared, the word of God can be given. And that opportunity is for that group of people to go take Jesus to their people. God also calls us, once we plan this process, it's our job as well to step out of the boat, to walk out into the area around us and find people, people that don't know Jesus, people that need Christ. Um, I, I looked at the statistics again the other day for a, a, a different yeah. reading, and there's still 40% of the people in Montrose attend some kind of fellowship. 60% of the people in Montrose don't go to church anywhere. Catholic, Mormon, Baha'i, that means that Two-thirds of the city don't know Jesus. And it's our plan to go all over the world and make disciples, beginning in our Jerusalem, which is here, and all around the world. So we're going to receive an alabaster offering this morning. I, I, I trust that you remember to bring your alabaster boxes. If you didn't, uh, we'll do this. We'll have it out again next week uh, for those who would like to give. But this time, we're just going to take a few moments. If you have your alabaster fund, uh, feel free to bring it here and put it in the church as we celebrate what God has done. And while they're bringing their alabaster offering, then our worship team will come over and give worship. You put yours in there already. All right. So Catherine has seated the church. <laughs> Let's stand together to prepare to worship the Lord this morning. I want to read some scriptures we begin this morning. It's, if you have a hymnal near you, it's on page 89. But this is what it says. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. We know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the son of God, God lives in him and he in God. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. Heavenly Father, help us today. Even on this snowy, cold Valentine's Day, to remember that love is not an emotional gift from one person to another. But rather it is love that you've already given us by the sacrifice of your son Jesus. And through him, we know love and share that love with one another. Bless us this morning as we worship today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together such love.
Lungs. Lungs. And so Montrose Hospital is in her conjunction. They don't know what it's caused. So I'm praying that she can use um, and she can get around that stage. So it's plenty of time to go. So. Okay, pray for Kinsey, who has uh, blood clots in her lungs. Okay. Kinsey, do you have a request for you for me? No. She is for me. Okay. Anybody else? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. We're going to sing a chorus that we're familiar with. Oh, how he loves you and me again. This altar is open uh, to bring you needs and requests that you might have uh, during our time.
Lord, we pray for these that we have mentioned to some of us. Lord, we pray for Sharon. Uh, we pray for Chad and Julie, for Lori, uh, for their family. And we just ask that you would comfort them in this loss. That, Lord, they lost their mother and grandmother. Uh, I just pray, Jesus, today that the love of God that surrounds us at this time and be present with them. Lord, think of the heart family today and Lord the couple of announcements that I want to uh, just bring to your attention. Uh, you may have noticed in the foyer there's some Valentine treats. So we're not going to have Bible study after worship today, but if you want to take a few moments to pick up a muffin or a cookie, a cup of coffee, fellowship a little bit, I uh, would encourage you to do that. So there's some treats out there in the foyer. The 22nd of February will be Women's Craft Night, so if you have any questions about that, just see Kathy and she can answer all of your questions, the meaning of life, everything like I'm just kidding, Kathy, but she'll answer your questions there. Again, Wednesday night. Um, this Wednesday, we're going to pray for our leaders. I just want to invite you to come and join us uh, this Wednesday at 7 o'clock uh, here at the church for the prayer boot camp. Uh, there's another announcement that's not in your bulletin, and that is on the 26th of February, which is a Friday night, uh, here at our church. Uh, we're going to gather with those who are can, who care about the work of the Church of the Nazarene in Colorado. Uh, many of you may not know, or, or you may know by now, that uh, Dave Ralph, our district superintendent, is retiring at the end of this assembly year, and so we'll be selecting a new district superintendent. And so the District Advisory Council, who kind of coordinates those things uh, in between this process, 
uh, as directed by Bob Broadwoods, who is our current regional director, but he retires this month, and then Stan Reeder, who, who will replace him. We're going to meet Friday night the 26th here at our church and kind of have a roundtable discussion about what we would think ought to be the kind of person we would call as a district superintendent. So if you're interested in that, at 6.30, uh, Friday night the 26th, um, we just invite you to come and be a part of that discussion. Um, there's going to be a survey you can fill out. I'll send an email out this week that has that survey online if you'd rather do it that way. Um, this will be all the churches west, uh, west of the divide from Durango, Cortez, up to Grand Junction, all of our Western Slope churches, uh, pastors and leaders uh, will be a part of that. So I would invite you to come. If you're interested to have more questions, just uh, see me afterwards and I can give you a little more information. At this time now, we're going to receive our tithes and offerings. So for ushers, we come. We'll receive our tithes and offerings this morning. Lord, again, I thank you for, for the faithfulness of your people. I thank you for the love that you throw through the giving of your tithes and offerings. So I pray you bless these gifts. Lord, would you bless them for the use of your kingdom. And continue to help us, Lord, to be about your purposes. In Jesus' name. Amen. The Old Testament reading is found in Exodus chapter 34, verses 1 to 8. The Lord said to Moses, Chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones, and I will write on them the words that were on the first tablets, which, are, which you broke. Be ready in the morning, and then come up on Mount Sinai. Present yourself to me there on top of the mountain. No one is to come with you or be seen anywhere on the mountain. Not even the flocks and herds may graze in front of the mountain. So Moses chiseled out two stone tab tablets like the first ones and went up Mount Sinai early in the morning as the Lord had commanded him. And he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. Moses bowed to the ground at once and worshiped. New Testament is John 3, 1 through 18. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the miraculous signs you're doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born again when he is old? Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases, it hear, you hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's 
spoke a few of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. That everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. So God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Well, it's Valentine's Day, so happy Valentine's Day, and um, uh, the Lord has a sense of humor in that this Valentine's Day across our country, things will be nice and snowy and cold uh, today, and so if there are some of you today, and I'm going to say this to the camera in the back, if there are some of you today that weren't able to make it to church, and you're watching this online, uh, there's about 20 people who, who braved the storm today, so we're glad that they came, and, and you're safe where you are, and you can hear what we're doing today. In 1967, Stanley Kramer and William Rose produced and directed a film that was kind of controversial at the time. It was called Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. In that film, um, Sidney Portier and Catherine Hepburn's daughter were a couple who met in Hawaii. They met in Hawaii and they began to, to, to fall in love with one another and Sidney Portier was a widower and and Catherine Hepburn's daughter had not been married. And so they wanted to come back and tell their families of their intent to marry. Well, there was only one problem. Sidney Fortier, as you probably know, was black. And Catherine Hepburn's daughter was white. And in 1967, that was quite the deal. In fact, it was one of the few films at the time that was willing to depict interracial marriage in a positive light. It was still illegal in 17 states. And it wasn't until June 12, 1967, six months before the film was released, that the last state legalized interracial marriage. So when they said, guess who's coming to dinner, they knew that they would be dropping a bombshell. Well, in our scripture today, Jesus also is going to drop a bombshell at a dinner. He was headed to Jerusalem for the Passover, where he would be betrayed, arrested, and crucified. Now, he knows his disciples, he's been telling his disciples this for a while, but his disciples just weren't getting it. In fact, in Luke 18, 34, Jesus said the disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them and they did not know what he was talking about. So I guess if people didn't know what Jesus was talking about, I can't feel too bad if people don't understand what I'm talking about. The disciples were blissfully unaware that this dinner that they were going to was going to be a, a controversial deal. So they're on their way to Jerusalem, and as they're headed there, they're passing through Bethany. Now Bethany is where Lazarus lived. So John chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, we read this. So six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Well, that's the dinner. Jesus is coming to Jerusalem. They're doing the normal thing. They're headed to Passover. They're going to do Passover and celebrate the Passover. And while they're on their way, they come to the place where Mary and Martha and Lazarus lived. So they thought, let's host a dinner. And Jesus is the guest of honor at the dinner. So my first thing I want to take a look at this morning is this. Look who came to dinner. There's several people we want to take note of today at the dinner. Number one, Simon the leper. Now, it doesn't say in John that Simon was at the dinner, but we know in Mark 14, verse 3, that Mark tells us that Simon actually was at the dinner because it was at his place. 
Mark 14, 3, while he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, so it was in Simon's house, a woman came with an alabaster jar, a very expensive perfume, made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured perfume on her head. Now we'll get to that story in just a second. But first what we're going to see here today, that Simon was hosting this dinner. So not only do we have Mary and Martha and Lazarus, now we have Simon the leper. But he's obviously not a leper anymore because otherwise he couldn't host the dinner. Why was he not a leper? Because Jesus had healed him. And Jesus had touched his body, healed him from the leprosy, and now here he was hosting a dinner in honor of Jesus. Now I mentioned also that Lazarus was there. Now that also makes an interesting person at the table. You talk about some good table talk. This is interesting because Lazarus had been dead and had been buried and had been resurrected. So if you wanted to have a conversation with somebody who had been dead and buried and resurrected, this is your opportunity. Let's step back to John chapter 11 for a second. It says, Jesus once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. The Lord said, Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time his, there is a bad odor, for he has been there for four days. Four days, Lazarus was in the tomb. They didn't have the same kind of embalming process as we did, so uh, and, and, and to, to speak in terms of the King James Version, but Lord, he stinketh. They didn't expect anything different. So Jesus said, did I tell you that if you believe, you'll see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here. That they would believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And he said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. So if you think Simon being healed of leprosy was a big deal, sitting at this table, now you have Lazarus, who was a former dead man, who God had raised from the dead, sitting at this table. And then there's a couple of others. Mary and Martha, Lazarus' sisters, were there. You may remember the conversation they had at a previous dinner. Martha was distracted by the preparations, and she came to Jesus and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Doesn't that just sound like home? You know, hey, I'm out here working. Jim could have said, hey, send somebody outside to help me shovel snow this morning. Um, you know, we already did that process, then do it again. Martha said, there's a lot of work to be done at this dinner. Tell my sister who's over here sitting at the feet of Jesus to come help me. The Lord answered, you're worried about and upset about many things. But few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better. It will not be taken away from her. So in other words, Jesus rearranged Martha's priorities. She was, at the time, worried about the dinner, not Jesus. Now here she is again at another dinner. What's she doing? She's doing what she always did. She was serving. But this time she was not complaining. This time she wasn't grumbling that there wasn't anybody helping her. This time she simply was preparing the plates so that Jesus could be honored. And there's Mary. Mary, who sat at the feet of Jesus at the previous dinner. Who in this dinner did something out of the ordinary. She went and got an alabaster jar of perfume. She broke it, and while they're having dinner, she poured it on Jesus' feet. That was probably a year's wages. That's where we come up with the term for our alabaster offerings, this alabaster jar, something that had been saved up for the proper time, broke it and poured out in worship to Jesus. And so when you come and give your alabaster offering, you are pouring out worship to Jesus today. But not everybody was happy. Somebody said, wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It's worth a year's wages. This is Judas' comment. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but he was a thief. And as keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. So here's that interesting group. Mary, Martha, 
Lazarus had been raised from the dead, Simon the leper who had been healed, Jesus' disciples sitting around the table, and also on the outside there was a large crowd of Jews that found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but they wanted to see Lazarus. Can you imagine that? You'd heard about this resurrection, but now the guy's going to be at this house. So in that house, surrounding that house, was a whole bunch of people being peepee toms, if you will, looking in the windows, hoping to catch a glimpse of Lazarus. Now this didn't sit well with the chief priests. So they made plans to kill Lazarus as well. Not only were they going to kill Jesus, now they're going to kill Lazarus because his testimony was drawing people there. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. So what I want you to see is here's the dinner. Jesus is the guest of honor. But Mary steals the show. Mary steps in in her act of worship draws attention away from Jesus. It's kind of like that Super Bowl streaker, the guy that ran out in the middle of the field during the ball game because he had made a bet that um, somebody would be a speaker at the Super Bowl, and then to make sure he won his bet, he ran out on the, on the field himself. Uh, I don't think he got the money. I think they shut him down on that. But it's kind of that process. You're watching the game, enjoying the game, and all of a sudden, somebody runs onto the field. You're like, what are you doing? That was kind of the feeling I think people had when Mary poured the alabaster lotion on Jesus' feet. A pint of pure nard, expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the perfume. Right in the middle of dinner. Right in the middle of everything that's going on, Mary breaks this open. You can't miss it. It's not like she took a little bit of ointment down here and kind of touched Jesus' feet. You know, this filled the whole house. You couldn't miss what was going on. And also, Jesus and the other guests are reclining at the table. They're not sitting on chairs like Americans. They're laying on their side like Middle Eastern people. And so, Jesus is laying on his side. His feet is in somebody's face. And she's pouring the, the perfume there. Why would Mary do that. So you see, that's my question this morning. Why would Mary do that? You and I wouldn't do that. Even our most devoted hearts, we would say to ourselves, we don't want to take the, 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 the spotlight off of Jesus. We don't want to take Jesus out of the spotlight and put it on us. So why would Mary do that? We read the passage that said it was worth the a year's wages, and Judas, who was financially motivated, said, why would you waste that money? I mean, it'd be like going back here to Daryl and taking a year's worth of wages and letting Daryl watch you burn up the cash. It wouldn't make him too happy. He said, if you're going to burn it, why not give it to me? You know? Why not at least give it to the church? The problem was they didn't understand the motive of Mary. Mary was worshiping Jesus and Jesus tells us in Matthew 26, verse 10, why she did it. She said, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for my burial. Mary was worshiping Jesus with all that she had. Whatever a burial plan she might have had, whatever life insurance process, that's really kind of what that perfume was. She had this perfume, and if Lazarus would die again, and Mary and Martha would have to take care of themselves, here was this resource, this financial resource that they could live on after Lazarus had gone on. But she took it and poured it out on Jesus. Her worship cost her something. So let me ask you a question. What does your worship cost you? This weekend, they're going to be spending several million dollars on flowers. And they're going to spend a lot of money on chocolates. And they're going to spend a lot of money on eating out and going to dinner. This is Valentine's weekend. And so, so there's going to be a lot of money spent on telling other people that they love them. 
So far, I've done pretty good. I've had the flowers in the car. So I, I've got that covered. We can always find chocolate. We don't have the same discount we used to have when Christopher worked at Russell Silver's, but we can find chocolate. You know, I want Kim to know that I love her, so I'm going to do these things which let her know that I love her. The reason I mentioned this is, why, what is the motive of our worship? What is the motive of our worship? Why did we show up here today in the middle of a snowstorm? You see, this morning you didn't have to be here. You even had an excuse today. You could have said, you know what, there's too much snow out there, so I'm not going to go to church. And I know they're going to record it, so I can even go online and watch it. And I can say that I've gone to church, I've done my duty, I've done my responsibility, but instead, you got out and you came to church. You shoveled your snow, some of you then came and shoveled our snow, and you put on your coat and you did all of this to come and worship Jesus. So my question is, why did you come? You see, we are all at the table with Jesus. I don't know, Dave, I'm scooping ahead a few slides there. <laughs> I um, can Dave does a great job back there, kind of trying to follow me in my sermon. But we're all at the table with Jesus. There's a bunch of stuff going on at this table. We see Judas and his greed. We see Lazarus and his celebrity. We see Mary and Martha. Mary who's adoring. Martha who's serving. We see the disciples who followed Jesus. We see all these people. And they came there to be at the table with Jesus. Jesus the healer. Jesus the light giver. Jesus the instructor. Jesus the object of worship. Jesus the son of the living God. You see, we gather today not because it's what we're supposed to do on Sunday. We gather today because we want to come into the presence of Jesus the Christ, the son of God. He is the reason they were there, and he is the reason we are here. Now, I've shared a couple of times about our, our little dog that lives in our house. They're cute little dogs most of the time. Sometimes they're annoying. Sometimes I just want to open the door and say bye. But then every once in a while, Emma will crawl on my lap. And because she's a silly terrier, she'll lay upside down. And she'll just stare at me. I mean, just stare at me like, oh, you're the best thing I've ever seen. And that's what she does. She just wants to be in my presence. That's what Mary was doing. She just wanted to be in the presence of God and worship Him. When was the last time you simply wanted to be in the presence of God? You didn't come because you needed something from Him to have a prayer request answered. You didn't come because you were trying to, to, to help the organization go along or pay the bills. You, you didn't come because all of these other things. You just simply wanted to be in the presence of Jesus. Mary got rid of her security and came to Jesus because she worshiped him. 1 John 5, verses 12 and 13 says, Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you that you might believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. John 20 says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you might have life in his name. There was a man who won a million dollars off a lotto ticket. He smashed off a lotto ticket, won a million dollars. The next day, he went to work. And his friend said, why in the world are you here? He says, why would you go to work if you just won a million dollars? Now, I have to confess, I'm not sure. But that's the question all of us have. If we know Jesus, do we worship him? 
when we worship him. So I ask you the question as we kind of wrap up today. Why did you come to church? Was it for your friends? Was it the coffee? The worship music? The preaching? Probably not the preaching. Or was it because today you prayed that God's Son, Jesus, would show up? And somewhere in the midst of everything that we do, we catch a glimpse of Jesus. And that's what God calls us to do every single day. To try to live our lives in worship of Jesus. And in the midst of everything that's going on, catch a glimpse of the Son of God who loves us and gave himself for us. John 10.10 says, Thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. John 3.16, that Jim read earlier today, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. We come today to worship Jesus. We come today to express our love for him. A lot of people are going to spend their day today showing love to someone that they care about in this earthly world. They're going to have some dinner. They're going to have some chocolate. They're going to, they're going to tell people that they love them. God calls us to show Jesus our love through our worship, whether it's our singing, whether it's our scripture reading, whether it's the giving of our offerings, or whether it's simply carrying out the ministry that God gave us. We are worshiping Jesus, and our eyes are fixed on him. So let's bow our heads and close our eyes this morning and I want us to just be kind of quiet for a second. And I want you to picture yourself sitting at the feet of Jesus, just like Mary was. With your eyes fixed on him, your mind, your, your thoughts focused on him, your ears listening for his voice. And just ask Jesus, what should my worship look like today? How can I worship you? The Israelites gathered around the mountain in the thunder wars. They gathered in the upper room and prayed. And Jesus walked in through the wall. Today, what does our worship look like? And how can we worship Jesus wherever we are? Lord, help us worship you. Help us to set aside all the things that are distracting, the things that draw our attention away from you. And Lord, help us to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfect of our faith. For for the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God the Father. Lord, help us to worship Jesus today whatever we do. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today is Valentine's Day. We worship the Lord. Let's continue to do so. Let us go and fellowship with one another. Uh, you can stand together and we're dismissed. Have a wonderful day.